the leader is is a leader because he is a servant. This leader is someone who inspires his followers, her followers. Through our series of Tutu Talks, the Desmond and Leah Tutu Legacy Foundation hopes to reframe unresolved issues within civil society and uncover what moral and ethical leadership entails. Welcome to the Tutu Talk. Really, really excited to have you join us. Thank you for having me, Pumi. Kopano, we always start by just getting to know the person. So can you tell us where are you are from? How did you grow up? Yeah, so I was born in Mamilodi in Pretoria um, and did most of my growing up sort of between Pretoria and Midrand. We eventually sort of settled in Midrand. Um, I'm the eldest of three. I've got a younger sister and brother. Um, and I was raised by really ordinary um, parents, um, but, but hardworking, um, who had dreams of wanting to better their own lives and wanting to seize the opportunities that came with sort of the new South Africa and wanted to give us a better start. So we grew up in a home that was, um, yeah, centered around reading, studying, spending time together, aspiring to, to uplift ourselves and, and those around us. Um, and yeah, I had a, a very wholesome childhood. Mm. And your parents, what did they do? Yeah, so my mom was a teacher initially. I mean, as you'll know, during a bad date, there weren't many options for black women. So she taught, but she studied part-time through UNISA. She wanted to become a psychologist. So that was a journey we saw her go on. Um, she eventually went on to do her PhD in psychology, which later would inspire me to follow a similar route. Um, whilst teaching, whilst raising three children, sort of started her practice and then and then went on to run her own private practice as an educational psychologist. And my dad um, came from very humble beginnings, um, but was a big dreamer and, and was blessed with, with, a, with a good head on him. So although didn't have a lot of money growing up, didn't have a lot of resources, knew that he was capable. And so worked peace jobs while he, um, so gardening and, you know, working at retail outlets while he studied um, through UNISA. And that was very formative for me because I saw him sort of, you know, working during the week and then on weekends going to libraries um, to study. He eventually wrote, wrote his board exams to become a CA. Um, didn't pass initially. And so that kind of disappointment of having to go back year on year. I remember I used to go with him to UNISA to check his results and just heartbreaking to see a grown man so disappointed that he hadn't make, made it. But he persisted. And he eventually did become a chartered accountant. And that was quite transformative for us as a family, economically. Suddenly we were able to do things we weren't able to do before, go to schools we hadn't that had been out of reach. So I think that was, yeah, very, very formative for me that education really can change your life and really inspired me um, to, to work hard and, and to yeah, use education as access to, to making a difference and to realizing my own dreams. Mm, so you went into medicine. I did. <laughs> yeah, why, why, why medicine? You know, I mean, I think back then, so I did quite well at school. I wasn't very good. At, I was terrible. Not even I wasn't very good. I was terrible at sport. I came from quite a conservative household. So, you know, it didn't quite fit the bill as a, as a cool kid. So really threw myself into my academics um, and excelled. And as you know, in many black families, it's kind of the big five, accounting, engineering, law, et cetera. Um, and I liked people. I liked their stories. I didn't know then that I would later get into sort of writing, but I did quite enjoy people's stories. And medicine was this combination of, you know, having the privilege to sit at the bedside and to people tell you about, you know, what they think has happened to them and how they've come to be where they are. But also it has a lot of sciences and, and mathematics. And of course, being an ambitious child, um, it was what was thought you you would do if you're smart, right? So went to med school um, and loved it. Um, I found it incredibly enriching. I'd say some of the best years of my sort of young adulthood life. Um, it was hard as well because you see a lot of the ills of South Africa kind of come together at the bedside. You know, the things that we get wrong manifest in disease and, um, and ill health. Um, and so I think it was the beginning of me looking beyond what I want to achieve personally, but what I can contribute to our society. 
Mm. So you're, you're not a, a medical doctor in the traditional sense um, of somebody you go to when you have a headache. Tell us a bit more about what you actually do for a living now. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I think as I alluded to, I quite early on realized that what we were seeing, you know, as students at the bedside was driven by what was happening in community um, and, and got quite frustrated by that as being someone who likes to solve problems and solve them in a sustainable way, readmitting the same baby because you discharge them into the, the same circumstance that they came from, where there's no water, there's no food, people are living in, in houses, if you can even call them that, that are not fit for living and that that is what's driving the diarrhea or the pneumonia you see at the bedside. So I quickly became quite intrigued by public health, um, not a very popular route. I think people want to be surgeons, obstetricians, but I could see that in a country like ours that has this long history of inequality where health is tightly tied to racial lines, you know, health and ill health, and that the sort of, um, yeah, kind of, um, life course or quality of life that people have is very much driven by apartheid and colonialism. It wasn't satisfactory for me to kind of leave it at having a private practice. And so I was quite lucky to have incredible mentors, Prof Bongani Mayosi, who sadly passed, but was really influential in my own thinking about my future. And so I heard about Oxford and the Rhodes Scholarship and was lucky to be successful. So I went on to do a master's in public health um, and, a, and a PhD. Um, and then came home um, and, yeah, got really fortunate to be able to work in the development space. I currently run a campaign focused on childhood malnutrition, which has been incredibly gratifying and rewarding to be able to use my, my skills and talents and opportunities to respond to a, a pressing problem in South Africa. Mm. Um, one of the things you mentioned just in passing earlier was that you've also written some books. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what is that about? <laughs> so that started off as a hobby. As I said, my family were, were very homebodies. I think, um, yeah, I guess a family of introverts, if, we, if I can call it that. So I spent a lot of time reading, um, loved books. And, and yeah, I am, you know, you travel as a child who, who's never really imagined their life beyond school and home, reading I Write What I Like and um, Titi Dangaremba, Nervous Conditions and Animal Farm um, at sort of 14, 15, 16, like was super transformative. And that on the backdrop of being in a school where I was one of the few black children was really, yeah, really shaped my consciousness, really shaped my sense of identity, my sense of justice. And I suppose being quite introverted myself and the, the place where I could kind of grapple with these questions about identity, about inequality, about justice, about our continent and, and how the world perceives us and our place in the world was through writing. It was a safe space for me to kind of work through these questions I myself was grappling with. And I got really lucky to be published at 21, um, my first novel, Coconut. And yeah, it was, a, it was an exciting and frightening time. Suddenly, things that you thought you were writing for sharing with friends and family were being read widely. But it did give me a confidence to trust my voice and that my voice matters and that our voices matter as Africans, as women, as black women particularly. Um, and so it resulted in me kind of doing it again. And I now have um, three novels and it's been a great, a great addition to my sort of more clinical um, and sort of science-based life in, in public health and medicine to be able to dabble in the creative arts as well. I am intrigued by the titles of the books. <laughs> and I, I believe that they were um, based on your life experience um, and, and your thoughts about um, the context of our country. Can you talk a bit more about why you felt um, compelled to, to write and, and share and, and what really jumps out at you for, from the stories that you've told in your book? Mm, yeah. So, I mean, I think... Um, I suppose there's a saying, you know, you don't know what you think until you write. And I think, as I mentioned, you know, um, came from a family that had almost like a, two parts to our family's life, you know, a pre and a post, a pre my dad qualifying as a CA and a post, and our life changed quite dramatically. Um, and um, 
for for, for resource wise for better, but but sort of cultural shock wise, um, was quite a transition. Um, and going you know into a school where I was one of a handful of, of black students was came with its own um, challenges, particularly at a time where you are forming your own sense of identity. And I think I'm grateful for the the literature that I was exposed to in the household, but also sad, I guess, at the time and confused by what sort of emerging black middle class was was collectively we were valuing as what we hoped, you know, children who certain accents, um, you know, our, our sense of beauty and what is beautiful um, and, and what happens to culture, what happens to language. So Coconut was really an exploration of all that from a sort of a coming of age novel you know, new post-apartheid South Africa, Rainbow Nation, and, and how it was we we envisioned who we would be as, as Black Africans in this post-democratic South Africa. And then um, Spilt Milk was kind of, you know, when <laughs> the cracks began to appear in the rainbow, as so many have said, um, and the reality that, you know, we we kind of thought the big battle was won, that it was a bad date. And it was, a, you know, the enemy was very identi- easily identifiable. But now we reached a time in post-apartheid South Africa where what's what's wrong and what's right became grey. Um, people who were entrusted to take care of our resources were found to be kind of using them for their own ends. And and spilt milk was really a grappling of of what one does with that and, and how do we how do we build um, how do we build forward and and period pain um, is you know I'm the I'm the worst person to kind of give you a summary <laughs> of what my novels are about because I I write all of it because I'm trying to figure it out but I suppose then a grappling with with issues of being woman of of GVV of xenophobia of our health system and how it fails our people, particularly Black people, who are at the mercies of um, the whims, um, the moods, the attitudes, the lack of resources. And I think that's actually gotten quite a bit worse now post-COVID. But yeah, I I suppose loosely they are all um, social commentaries um, on on our nation, um, but also just my own very personal and perhaps somewhat (laughs) self-indulgent grapplings of, of how we make sense of it all. You know, I came up as a young person um, at the height of, of the, the Rainbow Nation. I mean, I was nine um, when we went to vote and I remember my dad like jumping up and down, you know, watching the queues forming, um, you know, the Mandela years. And, and we really thought we were something special, you know, the South African exceptionalism, um, which also meant we missed opportunities to learn from our brothers and sisters in other contexts and how we were making many of the same mistakes that post-liberation African countries made. Um, and now that it is very clear that there have been many mistakes, um, um, deliberate or, or, or not deliberate, and that we have to really be active as citizens and, and, and protect this democracy of ours. Um, yeah, um, so a lot of my work is, is just grappling with, with some of our realities today. So you're, you're using your voice um, as a young South African, a young African, and um, I just wonder, with with so many young people feeling um, disillusioned, feeling like they don't have a voice, um, what do you what do you say to them if they're not seeing the future? Yeah, yeah, no, it's indeed a very challenging time and a and a yeah a dark time I would say in our country right now where things are living is hard food eating is hard, trying to find a job is hard. And, and being a young person in South Africa, your prospects are, are difficult and challenging. But I do think we are resilient people, that we have been through through difficult times and we have overcome. And to, I mean, as a person of faith myself, I do believe that each and every one of us has something to offer and is here for a reason. Um, and I think for me, I could have never imagined that people would read the work that I write, but it took a little bit of, of a little bit of stepping into the darkness and having a little bit of faith and confidence um, and trusting that, you know, I had I had something to contribute. And I would encourage young people, wherever it is, whether it's in sciences or music or sports or on stages or in the political sphere, I mean, I think that there's a desperate need of voices of integrity, of holding, um, yeah, the powerful accountable 
Um, and I think young people have historically done that for our country. I mean, we're currently in Youth Month. We celebrated Youth Day yesterday. And we have young people to thank for the country that we now have, their sacrifices and their courage. And, and that doesn't end with them. The baton has been passed forward. So I would encourage young people to, to, to trust their guts, trust their truth. There is only one of each of us. And unfortunately, there's no example of what your life will look like. You have to trust what you believe to be true um, and, to, and to do that with courage. But I do think that those of us who've had opportunities need to enable that, that it's hard. And we've, as I mentioned, I had great mentors. And so where we find ourselves in the workplace and community, to be a mentor, um, an encourager, an enabler for the young people around us. Wow. Um, how, how are you doing that in your career in terms of mentoring and, and bringing up those that are younger than yourself? Yeah, sure. I mean, I must say I'm passionate about women, black women, and, and really encouraging all of us to take up space. Um, I'm really lucky to work for a campaign where we are largely a woman-led team, we work on issues of motherhood. Um, we work, you know, on trying to address, as I mentioned, child and malnutrition. And I work with incredible young people who've um, come out of a wide variety of backgrounds and really trying to encourage people to, to take up opportunities when there's a promotion or there's an opportunity to study, to put one's hand up or, to, you know, to say um, that you want to do this. Um, I think often we, we struggle with imposter syndrome, with self-doubt. We want to get all the degrees and study all the things before we put our hand up, but you know, it's perfectly reasonable to learn on the job. I think I've been quite lucky to have had the leadership position I've had at quite a young age, um, with not like a tremendous amount of experience, but have been entrusted with that. And it's been a great honor and privilege. So wanting to create space um, at decision-making tables for young people to be able to do the same. Awesome. Um, we, we are a legacy foundation, um, steep, in the in the arches values and leadership style what what resonates with you um, about the arch and how he presented um, to all of us yeah I mean I think yeah the arch is an incredible human um, and there's so much to learn but I think what was most striking for me is having recently learned that the path that we know him for sort of you know as a theologian as an archbishop is not necessarily his first choice right it's plan b maybe c i don't know if there were other plans before that and initially he wanted to be an educator and i found that so inspiring that often in life we mourn we mourn the visions and the plans that we thought would be what would be best for us you know and that often life doesn't work like that but even in plan b c and d you can make a tremendous change and you can make, find so much happiness. You can bring so much joy to the lives of others. And that he, you know, left teaching because he was unhappy about Bantu education coming in, you know, went into to ministry that probably wasn't exactly what he pictured for his own life initially, but that where he found himself, he threw himself fully in. He made a difference. He continued to, to be the change that he wanted to see in the world. And I think particularly thinking back to our earlier you know, conversation around young people and the opportunities that our country perhaps isn't giving them right now, but where they find themselves, you know, if you didn't get into university and you bring, you know, you're starting something entrepreneurial, you can still make a difference in that and to kind of trust, trust the process, trust um, how life is unfolding um, keep showing up, you know, keep being the best that you can be, keep working with integrity, keep being honest, um, it, it makes a difference. And I think the Archer's life is, is one incredible example of that. So how are you applying the Archer's example in your own life, in your own um, leadership journey? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think particularly at this time, if I kind of make it context specific, I mean, we are struggling with um, issues of integrity, of stewardship of the resources that we have in our country, and really just being yeah, just, I mean, emphasizing that doing, I mean, it goes without saying, isn't it? But it seems now that, you know, those kind of very basic principles have really been eroded and really rob us and, and future, um, the future generation of South Africans and Africans, the opportunity to enjoy the, the fruits and the gifts of this beautiful country of ours and what's been fought for, you know, the many lives that have been lost, the families that have been split up and, and, um, the opportunities that people have given up in order for us to enjoy the, the freedoms and the democracies we now have. Um, 
and yeah in 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 everything one does to to do it with integrity to be a good steward of the little that you have been entrusted with i think is so important to me and i'm um so aware of that um and i think you know it it isn't just about the workplace right we live in neighborhoods we have families i think children family is the cornerstone of society and in our homes you know children are watching the news as we drive to work they're listening to corruption case after corruption case and and this can be a norm and there can be quite a lot of disillusionment and I think another thing that I've always admired about the arch is his optimism you know you know through all the storms um, that our country has been in you know he always had his chuckle I mean he was fierce and and he spoke truth to power but he was also always optimistic and I think we need that I think sometimes as Africans you know there's the sense of the plan B, C's and D's in Europe and in the US that people think, oh, you know, well, maybe we should just leave. But, but you know, what do, what, what do we then tell our children, right? Well, how does an African hold their head up high if we, we, we those who can, abandon um, our country um, and, and, and not fight for justice and not fight for these, this precious land of ours, this, this beautiful content, continent of ours that, that can, if we work together, if we work with integrity um, can be a giant um, and can contribute significantly to knowledge, to, to, to culture, to, to resources in the world. So I do think whether it's in our workplace, in our neighborhood, at dinner tables, in the car with children on a Sunday afternoon, um, to embody you know, the very basic principles that one would, would take for granted but seem to be eroding um, in our country at this time. Um, where where do you um, find the optimism? Because I think in in making commentary about the things that are going on in the country, you're still quite um, you're still quite optimistic about about where we're going. Mm. I suppose I I do believe that, but nothing is by chance, um, and you know where we find ourselves, the, the bodies and the skins we are born into, the families, the countries, the communities, is, is not a mistake, um, and that our lives are not a mistake, and that we are all unique, and we have something beautiful um, to contribute, gives me optimism. Um, and I suppose being a mother, wanting to leave this, this earth, this world a little bit better than I found it for my children and, uh, and children collectively, not, not necessarily my own, insists that we must be optimistic. And I think in the main, you know, people are good and people want good for each other and people want good for our society. And unfortunately, you know, as, as is often said, evil prevails when good men do nothing. So I, I do think we are at a point in our country where, um, it does require, you know, those of us who've been armchair commentators to really um, roll up our sleeves and get our hands um, wet um, because there's a lot of work to be done. I mean, it's it's shocking that children are dying of malnutrition in South Africa, an upper middle income country. Our education system is not performing well. You know, young people are um, hopeless um, and depressed because they can't get work opportunities. Um, those are things that we can change um, if, if all of us, where we find ourselves, commit to being part of the change we want to see in our country. So, yeah, I guess one has to be optimistic um, because those who came before us were, they believed, they fought because they believed things can be different. And I think we have a responsibility to do the same. Um, Kopano, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, very um, good conversation and also um, great to see somebody who's um, willing to speak out at such a young age and um, doing great things out there in the role that you are playing in society. So thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, Pumi. Thank you, Amin, to your team, Jacob and all of you for the opportunity. It's been really great. Thank you.